Hello, everyone. My name is Marianne Morrow, and I am delighted to moderate this very important conversation about the practical effects of immigration in the U.S. We have some powerhouse people here on the phone with me. Alavi, Aliwalia, Alcorn, Claire Chen, and we may have one more person, Stephen um, Beyer, also joining us. But let's just think about a couple of things. Uh, immigration is on our minds right now with what's happening on the world stage. And immigration is so important. Immigrants have founded and lead a disproportionately large number of American startups. So from a private as well as a public company perspective, we have four very large private companies, SpaceX, Stripe, Instacart, and Databricks that are led by immigrants and started by immigrants. And in the public domain, we have Elon Musk that has both private and public companies, uh, and he's followed with NVIDIA, Google, and Microsoft all being led by immigrants. So I'm going to allow each of you to spend a couple of minutes introducing yourselves, and, and but we're going to ask a question along right with this. And Claire, I'm going to start with you. You have been in and out of the U.S., working in and out of um, the United States. Why did you come to the U.S., and, and what is your immigration status, and what's your view of immigration? Oh, Claire, I think you're on mute. Hello? Hi, Marianne. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, I, uh, I'm here to discuss my personal, but I can share some experience. I've been in the U.S. since I was a little teenager. And uh, I was, uh, my first life was a professional runway fashion model in runway in New York, San Francisco, LA, San Taipei, Hong Kong, Tok Tokyo. But um, I've been in the U.S. since long time ago, 1995, in San Francisco Bay Area. And I went to school there, go to school there. That's my first life. After finishing school, I stayed there and started working. So that was a long time ago. So if you think about the um, the immigration law at that time, we are simply as a, you know, as a student and study, and then you get the, you know, practical training, and then you get the H1 visa, and then, or you, you can apply, the, the company will apply you, you are special talents, you get a green card, something like that. So that's a, a base, base uh, logic that I, I um, understand for this uh, official like process. But I don't know for the last long time uh, will be um, changed or not this day. So, um, so that that's uh, that's about me uh, in Fini. And but been working for a long time, so uh, I can introduce what we do. Um, we are a financial. Uh, Petite Financial Advisory Investment Management Consultancy, uh, working with a few partners more than 20, 20 years. Um, uh, we are currently an uh, advisory service in Racing Fund 3 for top VC uh, in USA. And also we are managing uh, two startups in the early stage uh, kick off the fundraising for this year, 2022, for Active Biotech. And so we are the pretty much a financial service provider, and we're also selling the pre-IPO share, which is a Silicon Valley unicorn. I think that's about me. And if you are interested to hear more, then we can talk more. Thank you. Sure. Claire, before we go on, can you talk meet. about your pathway kind of to citizenship? And, and what do you think about an increase you know, in, in GDP and jobs with regards to immigration? Uh, can you repeat? Sorry about that. Sure, sure. I'm, I'm thinking about a pathway to citizenship and, you know, increase um, in GDP and jobs all that stem from immigration. Can you touch on that a little bit? Sorry about the background noise. Uh, I, okay, I think uh, in general for immigration, okay, uh, to be a citizen of the United States, Last immigrant actually helped a lot of uh, job in the U.S. and you help the growth of the test revenue. I think that's a very good sign um, in positive way. So, but I'm gonna leave that to the professional because Sophie and, and, and many uh, lawyer in here. I'm not here to discuss for this point. Um, the things changed in the, in the last 20 years. I'm sure there are more way uh, good path to, uh, you know, getting the uh, American system or immigrants in the U.S. 
Yeah. All right. So let me turn to the lawyers here. Sophie and Helen, I'm going to start with you first. Um, you and I know each other really well. We're both um, out in Silicon Valley. Um, why does immigration matter? And, you know, who are creating these jobs? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here and be on such an illustrious panel and appreciative for the opportunity. Thank you, Marianne. It's wonderful to meet you, Claire, and it's wonderful to be able to participate in this with you, Pallavi. Um, I am, as you mentioned, an immigration attorney in Silicon Valley. I'm the founder of Alcorn Immigration Law and the author of the TechCrunch immigration advice column called Dear Sophie. And immigration matters a lot. Um, I have a I have been interviewing futurists on my podcast called Immigration Law for Tech Startups. And both futurists brought up this similar concept from Cold War 1950s called VUCA. Uh, we're living in times that are volatile, uncertain, um, something with a C, and ambiguous. And so it's difficult for people to deal. And how do we deal? Well, we have to have resilience. And where does resilience come from? One way to build resilience is through diversity. And immigration is really a way that we can build uh, resilience in, in any country in the world and the United States. I do inbound U.S. immigration law, visas and green cards. So the U.S. benefits a lot, especially from Silicon Valley and tech immigration that creates new companies, creates jobs for Americans, it creates you know, life-saving technologies and um, very uh, exciting software platforms that can connect and unite us. That's excellent. Can you tell us about a platform that we're all using today, Run the World? Do you know who created Run the World? I do. It was my client. And I'm so thrilled uh, that I, that she was comfortable with me telling her story. I'll, I'll put a link to it in the chat box. Her name is Xiaoyan Q. Um, she's a Stanford graduate. She was a product manager at Facebook. And she came to me several years ago and said, Sophie, um, you know, it's great that I'm doing projects that affect billions of people's Facebook usage, but I want to create my own startup and I and I need to chart my own immigration pathway. And so we were able to help her navigate her immigration process. And she came to me a few years ago and said that she was launching a new tech startup called Run the World. And here we are on her platform right now. So immigrants have brought us together today for this very conversation. That's so meaningful and just really humanizes everything that you do every day. I'm going to turn to Paula V. Please introduce yourself and also tell us about what inspires immigration. Surely. Um, my name is Paula V. Alawalia and I um, love being hosted here and speaking about something that we're so passionate about. Um, uh, and I speak from an immigration attorney who is also an immigrant. So uh, I think the interest in immigration started for me in law school. And I think my uh, writing project at that time was the history of immigrants. And so I think just true to that, I just see that this topic just does resonate a lot. Uh, run a firm in uh, Dallas and also an office in Houston. Um, um, been doing this uh, um, uh, for about 20 years and I have a few radio shows uh, uh, on FM stations where I answer questions for immigrant communities live on the air. I also attempt to speak Spanish once in a while and try and get my rudimentary Spanish to help Spanish speaking people with their immigration questions. But mostly, I uh, obviously, the shows are in English or in South Asian languages. Um, so to your question, I think uh, we can easily say, uh, and this is from a study in 2019, that about 86 million people have legally immigrated to the United States between um, 1783 and uh, this study was in 2019. And uh, the Though the legal regime uh, under which the immigrant uh, that they immigrated uh, under has changed radically over time, the politics are, uh, that kind of surround those changes have also remained contentious. But I think we can see one line, uh, one thing that underlies everything, and I think uh, it would be um, the economic reasons. I think that 
has been the most enduring reason for immigration and i would also say war and strife and we are going to be uh, you know talking about this a bit later on today uh, as well uh, as as we watch uh, ukraine um, you know uh, a spill of refugees that is going to come from that uh, a crisis currently but if you were to just look at history uh, from the colonial period through the industrial revolution uh, 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 industrial revolution the roaring 20s the great depression and up to today the radical sw swings that we've had in um, immigration policy have had their connections to uh, the same earlier debates and uh, policies they've been really a pull and push of uh, you know social requirements but again i just see that underlying economic um, pull uh, that has brought people into the us um, it may have a reason in some strife that's local uh, in their countries or those regions but eventually i think it's the promise of uh, the united states that brings people here so halavi i'm going to stay with you for a second let's talk about the need for stem and what are we seeing if especially in the tough subjects from an immigration perspective? Uh, so the top subjects, um, uh, actually, there was, uh, uh, there was some recent research that said about 70% of all full-time graduate students at U.S. universities, and we're talking about uh, electrical engineering, industrial engineering, computer and information sciences, are immigrants. They're, you know, F1 foreign nationals. They're immigrants. They're... Uh, they're here, they're studying. So um, a lot of uh, uh, STEM subjects that draw immigrant communities. And I think that's been um, uh, that's been the strength of the United States uh, that we have had. We've been able to attract the brightest and the ones that innovate. And by opening the STEM uh, uh, programs to um, invite people who come and innovate within our borders and produce great results. Um, but just one quick thing on that one would be, I mean, and this is interesting because January 21st of this year, and Sophie would have also uh, noticed this, this was an announcement from uh, the White House, and that was, um, it actually just spoke towards STEM. And um, I, I I have that uh, little announcement here, and that says, actions to attract STEM talent and strengthen our economy and competitiveness and um and they obviously laid out the the same premise that we're discussing just now that uh, one of america's greatest strengths is our ability to attract global talent to strengthen our economy and technological competitiveness and benefit working people and communities all across the country so i think uh, it just uh, speaks to that Right following that, we had USCIS that made accommodations, added a bunch of degrees to the STEM program. And uh, and the STEM program is a coveted program for a lot of foreign nationals who are students um, because it gives them an extra two years of work experience while after they complete their degree. So adding to those degrees and uh, uh, and that would really make it attractive for people who are thinking of going to other countries um, that uh, they go to study at. So, so that's what I would say. Thank you. Sophie, I'm gonna turn back to you. Talk a little bit about our aging workforce and you know, do you have any perspective on how we can attract immigrants and where we see foreign policy um, that might have an influence on immigration? Oops, you're on mute. Thank you, Marianne. Um, yeah, our workforce is aging. There are millions of available tech jobs in the United States right now with the great resignation. Um, higher education in large part is being funded by international student tuition. So these are all trends in our population that Will have effects on our society and and immigration is really important to all of them so um one of the things that we're looking at right now with um like breaking cutting edge um, immigration news is these generational research bills to fund stem and Pallavi has been talking about these amazing developments within the administration um congress is hoping to fund 
research initiatives, job creation in the United States as well to keep us competitive. And um, part of that is potentially creating a startup visa. And that's something I'm so excited about and could help the United States so much. It's a bill called the Like Act that Representative Zoe Loughran from California, um, who heads up the House Judiciary Subcommittee on Immigration, was able to introduce into um, Congress last summer. And it was recently included in the um, Competes Act that the House approved. And so right now, uh, House and Republican senators, everybody's negotiating on which provisions will be in the streamlined uh, research bill that they're eventually going to vote again on in the House and the Senate. And I really hope that they somehow manage to include founder, startup founder, immigration visas and green card pathways in this bill. Another thing they're looking at is unlimited green cards for people with PhDs in the STEM fields. Um, both of these would help supplement our work and make us competitive in so many ways as our population is changing. That's terrific. Claire, I'm going to move over to you, back to you. Um, and can you talk about your connections with taking VCs and entrepreneurs or startups? How are you working through that? And what do you see is is happening with regards to the way that we're funding some of these communities? You know, what are the challenges? What are what is your perspective on that? Marianne, was that to me? I was putting it to Claire. Claire, can you answer that one? Claire, we see we see you that you're still muted. Can you unmute? There we go. Okay, can you? Okay. So um, I think um, my my suggestion is for the between a startup or a VC, um, they have a good brilliant idea, a proof of concept, and uh, find a good uh, law firm, just like Sophie's firm, that particular helping the startup company to apply all the working visa, they do have a program to go follow up. So you can legally stay in the United States and you can do your fundraising, get your um, firms to off the ground in the U.S. and the branding of your market from the U.S. to worldwide. And uh, I, the VC or startup are both very important. They are actually all linked together. So uh, we'll have a good um, um, help with that. So. I, I think uh, this question uh, should be a lawyer to answer with that. <laughs> be better. Happy to <laughs> have I do want to talk in. about, um, uh, if we're going to go into the topic, I would really want to uh, 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 address the, um, the now the situation about uh, the immigrants, uh, uh, immigrations in Europe and U.S. Uh, uh, over overview. So I had an idea about the overview in the uh, Europe. So I can give an example about the Netherlands. Uh, what's sure. the benefit for those uh, uh, people or also the immigrants uh, in the U.S.? Yeah, please go ahead with that. Oh, okay, great. So, um, I, uh, okay, about two months ago, uh, this, uh, your Europe, this, uh, Okay, so uh, how about this? Let's just take a look at the benefit of welcoming the you know migrant workers, and uh, starting with the most uh, obvious that we are all getting old. That you know, I read one of the article, and the Dutch and European economy uh, will desperately need workers from outside of Europe. So the European Commission estimated the Euro Europe's the work working uh, age population is going to. You know, de decreased by seven percent, and between the 2015 to 2035, and that's uh, 80 million people to put in national context of the country, uh, such as the Netherlands. So, if in 2012 uh, there were four potential working people for every uh, pensioner, but by the 2040, that's uh, going to be um, just two. So let's talk about the U.S. and um, the citizen ship for undocumented immigrants uh, would boost up the U.S. economy for 
as the Biden administration and Congress、uh, craft their recovery. Recovery、uh, legislations and consider how best to move the nation's policies towards to a more fair,、uh, human, and, and, and、um, workable immigration system. So the the center of the American、um, progress and the University of California Davis Global Migrant Center moderated the planning impacts for several proposals that currently before the you know Congress using a、uh, you know this.、Uh, You know, idea、uh, come up some、um, scenario, and I think that's very good.、Um, this, uh, such this、uh, legislation would、uh, increase、uh, productivity and wage, and not just only for those、uh, you know, thinkable for you know the people,、um, but for all the American workers and create a hundred thousand job and increase the、uh, tax revenue. And the one of the I can、uh, two example of the、uh, scenario, which is they providing a pathway of citizenship for undocumented immigrants to the United States, we boost the U.S. growth, the domestic product. I mean, by the、uh, cumulative total 1.7 trillion over the 10 years, we、uh, get 400 400 thousand、uh, new jobs. For Serenio, Serenio、uh, too, which is providing the pathway to the citizen for undocumented. Claire, you were going in and out there a little bit, so I'm going to move on to Pelavi. Wanted to ask Pelavi if you can talk、uh, about the ethical policy changes. There's just this ethical component to these discussions that may be initially overlooked. So, what are your thoughts on the the ethical implications of immigration? Unmute. All right. Okay. So, I think if you were to just、um, uh, look at、uh, the good policies of、um, the greater economies,、uh, the wealthier nations、right, that attract immigrants to、uh, to come in and innovate within their borders, I think the、um, there is also something that we call brain drain, right? From the Less fortunate countries, the ones that don't have systems that are set up that support their own populations,、uh, that don't、uh, give them prime examples. I mean, I think、uh, it's known a lot of,、uh, and I speak for the South Asian communities or、um, mainly Indians that have moved to uh, different uh, countries away.、Uh, a third world country like India, as powerful as our brains are. Or have been collectively, or even individually, we found、um, success in other nations that were more welcoming and provided growth to each one of those immigrants. And the sad part of that would remain that、um, uh, uh, that is a loss for this, those countries where the immigrants come from. So I'd say that you know some consideration, if you were to say, you know what, an ideal world,、uh, the world is flat,、uh, you know borders are open. And people just go wherever there is work.、Um, the unfortunate part of that impact would be, I'd say, that the wealthier nations still would end up with uh, uh, people that go to them, and the not so uh, lucky um, uh, nations would have that brain drain still happen. So whether or not we have good immigration policies that attract the talent, I would say that even if it were to be where you were to allow. People to、uh, go on to、uh, you know、um, the other nations where you know not very strongly set up.、Uh, people would still move to where the economics are right for them, and there is growth. So I'd say, I mean, yes, there should be some discussions, but、uh, I mean, it really is a rhetorical question. What should countries do, right? I mean, every country wants one. Uh, um, their growth, they want、uh, success, and I think、um, the U.S. has a seat um, um, where innovation is, where growth is. We're ahead. We're leaders, and we're leaders because、uh, we have to recognize because of immigrants. So, and if you it want, and and you know, we still bemoan、uh, the lack of. You know, there are many many better things that the immigration system can do, but. With, Whatever it's done so far、um, with the immigrants, we have still a decent、um, chunk that show up in the U.S. 
right? And this is when we're saying, listen, let's remove per country caps. So let's do, uh, you know, all the reform that we're thinking about. Let's get the immigrants in here. Let's um, get the PhDs or after they've done their PhD from here, a green card quickly, uh, right? Let's hand them their green cards along with their uh, degrees. Uh, we kind of still know that uh, um, we're still the better nation here that have attracted that talent. Yes. Sophie, you have said that the top VC priority is access to human capital and creating a path to unlimited green cards. And some have called your work courageous. What gets you out of bed in the morning to fight this battle every single day? Oh. Tell us what happens at the Alcorn home. Every day is such an exciting adventure, Marianne. Oh my goodness. I started my law firm six years ago out of my kitchen when my kids were one and four and bootstrapped and we're about to hit 20, a team of 25 and working with over 200 venture funded uh, tech and biotech startups and having helped hundreds, if not, you know, maybe thousands of founders from all over the world to come to the United States. Every day is an exciting adventure. Um, I got tapped by the National Venture Capital Association to help Zoe Lofgren's team with the Like Act that I mentioned. That was a, definitely a bucket list um, opportunity to, to help edit a law. And I couldn't believe that it was happening. And then when I was in it, it was like, ooh, I could you know, follow my good girl conditioning and just say, oh, this is so lovely, please make this law happen. Or I could be bold and actually give feedback. And um, so I, I put myself out there and I suggested a whole lot of changes to the bill, like um, immediate spousal work authorization and premium processing built into the law itself and making sure that children won't age out. This is all on the, on the founder immigration and building a structure to uh, create the number of employee visas based on the U.S. company size so it can scale. And that was, that was such an exciting, exciting opportunity. And some of the things I'm thinking about now and working on now that I would love and appreciate collaboration and support for, um, we need better technologies as immigration lawyers to navigate this system and for our clients to, to solve their immigration. And the government isn't customer service friendly. So that means that as lawyers, it's our job to step up and be that positive interface for them navigating a very challenging um, situation. And I'm excited to work on a pathway for venture funding for international students in the United States who dream of being startup founders, but think that they have to go the standard corporate route of an H-1B through a big uh, tech company until they have a green card. And uh, the wait times for green cards for people born in China and India are so long. It could be decades uh, for people to get their spot in line. And so anything um, to Pallavi's point of America attracts the best and the brightest. We can talk about ethical things, but ultimately people are individual agents following their hearts. How can we empower people to follow their hearts? And that's, that's my vision, a world in which everybody, regardless of the circumstances of their birth, can go wherever, be whatever, do whatever their, their heart's desire is. Um, so that's what gets me out of bed in the morning. It's an exciting time. Yeah, that's very powerful. So now let's look at the world stage. Considering the invasion of Ukraine and just this flood of immigrants seeking asylum around the globe, um, it would be inappropriate for us not to address the crisis in our discussion today. So what can we do individually and together um, this afternoon to have some, to spark this conversation and make sure that that we address this. What you know? What's your perspective on how businesses like the ones that are represented here on this panel, and just people and organizations um, that you regularly work with, you know, what can be useful, helpful, and and also purposeful in times like these? So I'm just going to open mic this. Please, um, you know, jump in. And if there's somebody in the audience that would like to to grab the mic and also speak on this, please just um, ping us here in the comments section. Who wants to go first? 
I can so speak to it briefly. Um, there's an article I wrote that I'll put in the chat window because I was getting a lot of VCs and their portfolio companies asking, uh, how can we support immigration sponsorship for Ukrainian citizens, whether they're inside the United States or outside the United States? And um, the article talks a little bit about asylum and humanitarian parole, which are the non-work-based statuses, but they're really hard to get and they take a long time. So um, if you are at a U.S. tech company and you're already working with Ukrainian contractors, there are a lot of immigration, uh, non-immigrant working visas that allow for premium processing where you could theoretically sponsor somebody and get them here in, in a few months, possibly. So that's one resource. And I know there's a lot of organizations uh, stepping up to collect donations and um, NAFSA, the International Student Educator Association, has some good resources. Um, but I would love to you know, know what resources my, my co-panelists are, are staying abreast of. Um, so just on a very, very minute scale, and, and this is just to provide accessibility, uh, accessibility to um, uh, the immigrant communities. We are, our site actually uh, translates into many languages. And I think just a few days back, we've told our uh, web guys to just kind of uh, provide translations in Ukrainian to when we would be posting updates through our site uh, um, uh, to people um, that want to read in that. So you actually can have a Dropbox and a very, very minute in terms of the help that would provide. But I think on a larger level, uh, the government has stepped in. Uh, unfortunately, not really out there, but more uh, reactively to people who are present in the country. Uh, we're talking about temporary protected status for people who are here, some work authorization for students, um, you know, uh, some expedite requests. Uh, just a little while back at SAPE, uh, I just saw this come in maybe an hour before this started out that uh, the USCIS had reminded the public that they uh, will be providing services uh, to help people affected by the extreme situations, including uh, the invasion of uh, Ukraine and uh, changing non-immigrant statuses, basically, um, you know, withholding de deportation for right now. So, uh, so there is some protection that is being given. But again, this is within our borders for the people who are present. So this is more in empathy and sympathy, right, uh, rather than we opening a table or two or 10 or, or a thousand out there um, on the borders where uh, there's a strain and saying, hey, the, we're, we have, this is our border right now. Let's just do this and uh, get you all to register as refugees and do something like that. I mean, imagine the trek that they would have to make to just even come to the US border to ask for refugee status. So, so they have to be dealt with um, in the borders of the countries and those countries we know um, are, uh, you know, uh, Germany and Poland and the ones that are around that are going to take. Uh, we know that there are about a million people who have already fled uh, Ukraine. That's a huge number. Um, we also know that, um, so one little thing, and, and again, this is more for information than for anything else. Uh, I don't know if personally we can do anything at this point for this matter, but um, since the embassies um, of uh, Kiev and the other uh, cities where U.S. embassies were, they are closed. I think they've opened uh, services in uh, Poland and they've opened services in Germany and they've actually listed out on the Department of State websites where all people can go and get um, uh, their uh, uh, cases processed. So I think there are things that are happening there. The only thing that we can do at a uh, smaller level is to help agencies that are doing any anything, offer any help that we can. Um, but again, we just watch it with dismay. And I think the impact of what's happening will be felt for years to come. And it, it, it's so, so sad. Uh, I mean, if you were to just get attached to even one story, um, uh, it just kind of just, just moves you. And you just kind of wonder how, what kind of, pressure and fear that made people leave with their young kids and just run out of there and you know and there I know there are a bunch of students who are trying to get out of there they are foreign nationals who are going to go study medicine there and um, and in the uh, Indian uh, communities there was this one kid who was going to med medical school in Ukraine he was in a bunker and uh, and again, you know, again, the plight of immigrants, right? You're, you're going to be everywhere. And uh, he was in a bunker and I think he volunteered to go get lunch for uh, the other people there. And when he stepped out, he uh, he got hit.
and he did not make it back. So it's like a huge story that's going on in India. Obviously, what's the chance? You know, I mean, you're going to have that, and uh, and so so there is. Uh, we are watching this unfold, um, and uh, just having to be able to help whoever approaches us, making us ourselves as approachable as we can to of, offer that assistance. But again, we're going to watch for it to play out. Claire, Claire, what is your perspective? Oh, you're on mute. Oh, we still can't hear you. You're on mute. Yeah, I think that you're, I can see you off mute, but we still cannot hear you. No, gosh, Claire, um, we still cannot hear you. So Uh, the connection is not good. So I'm just going to ask another question and then hopefully sure. Claire, you can um, join in. Can you, I, any, any sense? Claire? No, so I can't hear you. So we have about um, 10 minutes left. So um, Sophie and Pallavi and Claire, if you can join in, you know, this is the practical effects of immigration into the U.S. Is there anything else that we have not covered that you want to share from your perspective? Because, you know, both of you, um, Pallavi and, and Sophie, are uh, immigration attorneys. This is your life work. You know, what other perspectives do you have? Immigration is huge. And basically, uh, Pallavi, you might have this experience, too, talking to new immigration lawyers early in their careers. You could basically build a whole a whole practice around, um, you know, immigration for Irish musicians or immigration for uh, Brazilian software engineers. And so it really this this desire to have a better life um, and take advantage of opportunity is, is really a universal human experience. And so the voices, the groups, the perspectives, it's, uh, it's truly unlimited. Um, and I've, I find that really inspiring as a, as a practitioner. Um, Pallavi, what, uh, I'm curious because our, 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 our practices are a little bit different, but um, I know you work so closely with so many individuals from so many different countries. Um, is there a, a particular uh, victory that you're super proud of lately? Or no, I, mean, I think I, I would just not, I mean, this is ongoing. So, um, and of course I represent companies and investors as well. Um, so my practice um, is um, all, in all areas of immigration. And of course I do, fa we, the firm also does, and I have more lawyers here. Uh, we also do family law and corporate law, um, but um, um, in I think most of the stories that we have, uh, and I'd say even if it was an employment-based case, I think it still comes down to touch that individual whose visa that you got approved. And I think we went through the harrowing four years last four years where the mission, the agency mission had changed to protect the rights of U.S. citizens as opposed to providing customer service to the immigrant community that was paying the filing fees and going through the wait times and all of that. And I think with great relief, and I'm, I'll go on to my story, but with great relief, we saw the agency mission change recently and become a little bit more equitable and fairer to the immigrant community. And I think just in that perspective, it, if you set up the agency to say, I'm pitting you, the immigrant, against the rest of the world in the United States. You're going to have a different adjudication trend and pattern from the officers as opposed to you saying, hey, you know, you, the immigrant, we value. Um, we're going to look at your thing, make sure that there is it's good faith, it's bona fide, it's, there is no fraud. And we're going to do a fair job in taking care of you, right? And I think that's where we're at right now is that we're at uh, going around to that fairer standard, we had a lot more war stories, um, I'd say about four years back when we were just looking at ridiculous denials and fighting every audit and every uh, every case that we had right. that came to us. Um, but um, I'd say that uh, uh, recently, so we have this um, uh, lovely couple, uh, a Spanish, I think she's a um, Guatemalan uh, lady who um, is an immigrant into the U.S., but now a U.S. citizen, has uh, 
uh, several ki uh, kids. Uh, she is a customer service representative for a trucking agency, and um, her uh, one one of the other representatives that services uh, the company is sitting in India. And while uh, and he's a Punjabi guy, and you know hardly probably speaks much English. And here this is a Spanish girl, uh, and um, and sh they fall in love. Okay, no. they 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 talk to each other all day. Uh, they uh, they chat all day, and finally, after a little while, this girl decided that, uh, and she's a lady, that I'm going to file for, I'm going to get married to him. So he can't come here. She treks uh, her way to India, meets the family, stays in a village, um, a small little area, goes through, uh, uh, you know, um, an Indian wedding, uh, then comes back here, goes back again, then files for him. And... Uh, so I mentioned this, Sophie and uh, others, that there's a discrepancy in the culture, uh, in the age. She was older than him. Uh, she had kids. He had never been married. Uh, so as we can understand how immigration thinks, there has to be fraud because how can he want to marry somebody who is um, a little bit older and from a different culture, right? And here we are thinking like, listen, this is love. They talk all day in their company. They are chatting constantly. So, and it wouldn't be surprising if this happened. So um, uh, long story short, three years for fast forward, he goes for his interview, no chance, um, takes all the papers, asks him one question and not really dealing with the bona fides of the relationship and denies the case. Okay. And, um, and the denial of the case, and I could guess that the denial was probably coming because okay they were disseparate in how they looked and the immigration wants people to be pretty even like if you're uh, white you should marry white and if you're same religion the age should be you know something that you would want to marry so things of that nature so and we're talking about department of state which is actually the most uh, uh, undisciplined agencies amongst uh, the immigration agencies currently. Um, I think USCIS has uh, still come down to heel and is doing well. But um, National Visa Center, the counselors are on their own for right now. They're they're Rambos. So we get this denial and we write uh, an email like, God, really? If you had questions about their bona fides, would you not ask us attorneys? I mean, we'll show you reams and reams of communication for these guys over the last three years. I mean, ask us. We're here. I mean, just don't deny it. Honestly, we don't know what worked there. And that's why we're talking about this. Uh, but the guy got a call from uh, the, uh, the consulate and says, can you come for, with your passport? They stamp his passport. His wife calls us two days before saying, listen, guys, my husband didn't tell me. I just got a call from him and he says, can you come to the airport? I'm in Dallas. And here we are going, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so something worked. I don't know what worked. Congratulations. But worked here. So we were, oh. we were just, uh, so that's a recent uh, story for, for me. That's, That's amazing. a wonderful story. Congratulations. So we have about a minute left. I and mean, this is the lightning round, everyone. Unmike yourselves. Are you hopeful about immigration? Pallavi, keep going. Yes, I am. I, the only thing that, you know, I mean, we're looking at all of these uh, different acts that, and so many, you know, things that go through the House or the Senate, but they never seem to reconcile. And I think though i would always say and that started out last year saying oh my god immigration reform finally we have 11 pe million people here that need to be dealt with plus we have other backlogs from the legal channels that also have to be dealt with we're going to have reform and we have a majority which who we thought would think similarly but unfortunately not um, many of the immigration proposals have not even been uh, passed on by the parliamentarian uh, onto the house for it to be considered. So I'm I'm hopeful, but so far disappointed is what I'd say. Okay, we got less than a, than thirty seconds. Claire, you want to weigh in? Hopeful? Yes, she's saying yes. All right, Sophie, bring it home. What are your thoughts? Eternally hopeful. Uh, come hell or high water, this whole system needs to be disrupted. We can piecemeal find solutions for people individually. We need systemic change, uh, whether we need to do that through 
lawmakers or just through private industry, making it easier through a technology solution. Uh, we are we we stand committed. So it's happening. Excellent. Well, I thank all of you today. Thank you, ladies, for talking about the practical immigration aspect. Pallavi Aliwalia, Claire Chen and Sophie Alcorn. It's been a pleasure to moderate this panel. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Marianne. You. Thank you, Marianne. Wonderful Bye, everyone. to be here with everybody. Bye.